when we talked last, uh, we kind of give a, a, a more in-depth view on what what a reading group and the uh, discussion groups are and everything. <clears throat> so we're not gonna go into details as to some of the nuanced things of like an agenda or the organizing meeting and things of that nature. We can talk about that if you want to know about that, if you if you like. Um, but we're just gonna get into like the more important things as to why you need to have a reading and or discussion group, um, mm -hmm. whether it's in your local Green Party group or any other left group that you're a part of, um, why something like this is important. Um, and I guess I can provide a, a little. Yeah, um, can I just tell you guys why, why I'm here? I mean, it's yeah, um, I mean, I'm a UCLA that'd, that'd student. Be awesome. um, and yeah, I'm kind of involved in a lot of different uh, like clubs and things on campus, but none of them are like directly political. Um, What's cool? And I'm trying to create a space where we can, you know, have those discussions that are, you know, super important these days. Um, and I've been doing a lot of reading on various, I'm, I'm an ecologist. Um, and so my philosoph or political theory kind of started with, with some anarchism and Bookchin yep. and, and a few others. Um, but I, I've really kind of branched out since then, but I, I'm trying to, you know, help get people to start thinking a little bit more about like the ecological problems with capitalism and um, also tie that to, you know, political praxis as well as, you know, some of the, I mean, I, it starts with the theory. So trying to get those conversations to happen and mix all the groups that I'm involved in and try to find all the people who are interested in having those discussions and kind of create a, a space for that. What school? You um, UCLA. It's a pretty big one. Oh, that's nice. Cool. I've heard it's nice. Yeah. Got a beautiful uh, okay, Jordan. Yeah, and even um, what you described, it's even more important to have a reading or discussion group and um well once upon a time when i was an undergrad i mean that's i mean we kind of did that with amongst ourselves um but it was just for our classes we didn't do like an independent reading or discussion group like what we're offering tonight but still i think kind of if i may like that kind of infiltration of your classes and kind of inserting those kind of politics um, and those already constructed groups that you're in and your classes are, are will be great, you know, because uh, it's always great. Because mm -hmm. even some of my former students always tell me, I'm like, we talked about Marx in my group, I'm like, good job. <laughs> now talk about these people. <laughs> yeah, I've had only one class that actually like verged on the political because I mean, I, you know, a lot of my classes are very STEM focused, scientific, and I mean, there isn't a lot of discussion. Um, but, you know, those, those small opportunities to like bring in to like have some very important discussions have really energized, galvanized me. That's a good word. Um, and, and I definitely want to get more active on that front. Yeah, especially what you're doing, because um, your degree is in ecology or yeah. thereabouts. It's kind of social ecology in a very specific oh, way, kind of. Nice. Yeah. Very it's nice. not specifically social ecology. I'm out in the field this summer doing physical ecology, but I much prefer the the sociological, uh, earth changing aspects of what we need to do. Yeah, and if I'm sure you've read by now some of these things by now, so like things in deep ecology. Yeah, I read Bookchin's polemic, <laughs> um, Deep Ecology and Anarchism. That was my first introduction to that. But I'm actually reading another book or an anthology right now that has some deep ecologist thinkers involved in that. Yeah, I, I've also encouraged some students who are in environmental science to do like uh, read Animal Liberation Front stuff, but... Mm -hmm still have a little bit of a critique as to like what they do from time to time but just pay attention to like what they're talking about mm -hmm. um 
if, if you want to do what they're practicing, I mean, that's on, that's on you. But I mean, at least just pay attention to like what animal liberation is talking about and how do we become good environmentalists when talking about animal liberation and human liberation at the same time. Yeah. A lot of my studies have been focused on our food system, but I personally think that it's systemic and that me, like, like I'm, I'm not vegetarian or vegan for any of those, for like the systemic issues well, sure. of the problem and it's not individual actions that are going to save the world on that front. So, uh, well, for sure. But I haven't done any reading on that. Do you have that presentation up ready, Garrett? Yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, I'll talk. <laughs> uh, let me hit share here. Oh, I see. Okay, cool. Uh, is that working? Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Yeah, just uh, let me know. You just want to go straight through the slides, or were there a particular one? Uh, just those, just those, just going to cover those first two. Okay. So, again, speaking of Bookchin, um, so I think, again, Jordan, we, we're trying to really, really highlight the importance of why these groups exist. And we have to start a little bit with Bookchin. Um, as you can see on the screen here, you know, uh, uh, as, as you know, if you've read Bookchin, that he really strongly advocated like the discussion and study groups are the first step to any revolutionary movement. And having study groups that help create that solidarity and shared language in order to build some something that's mass and organizing it's a political movement. Um, and so any training you go to when it comes to organizing or activism they'll talk about you know always organize there's agitation and organ and organ organizing right but the other piece of that formula if it were is education you know so there's agitate educate organize um if if we not only those of us on the call but everyone else if we do not understand these issues then what in the hell are we organizing for so it's, it's, it's one thing to go out and say, yeah, we're organizing for Fight for 15. We're there to save the sea otters there in California. We're, uh, you know, fighting pipelines. That's great. But why is this an issue? So if we don't understand these issues, then we're not going to understand the very policies that some of these things are going through the state house and federal level and everything, right? So... That's why we need these reading groups or discussion groups, however you want to, whatever you want to create. Um, there are many outside of what we're trying to cultivate through the Green Socialist Organizing Project. There's a lot of anarchist free schools that have been around since the 70s and they still continue to this day. Um, there are various radical organizations that are not only on campus, but in communities as well. Um, there's like a a free school, like I said, a free school up at Madison. Um, there's some radical study groups, and I'm just picking the ones in the Midwest because I know those a little bit more, better. Uh, study groups like uh, in Chicago and Milwaukee and Detroit, um, some in St. Louis. I know there's some out, out in Denver, a couple I know in New York as well. So these things exist, but what we're trying to really advocate for is to do it more on a very local level and then hopefully that can start building into more networks into other reading groups and if Gary can go to the next slide so the other thing about these reading groups is what Heller says from the Institute of Social Ecology and if you don't know that organization Jordan you better um, what Heller says is that we, we have to identify these three things. You know, we have to understand the critical moment, a reconstructive moment, and an illustrative moment. Um, and 
with these things, we, we have to understand like some critical moments, so, like the critical moment right now is the abortion ban in Texas, right? So while that is like a critical moment, then we can talk about that. We can do a reading group around the abortion ban. We, we can pull various texts, whether it be articles or websites or magazines. And, that, and that's, I think that's the one critical point to make is that this doesn't have to be an academic thing. You know, um, it doesn't have to like have this much text to understand something, you know? I mean, you, you can have a book like this and maybe take a chapter out of it and talk about something. Um, but again, it can be an article. Again, it doesn't be an academic journal. It can be an article from, you know, like from like in these times, Jacobin, um, labor, labor notes, things of that nature, um, popular resistance on their website. You know, uh, Hampton Institute is another one, Institute for Social Ecology. So it, it can be any kind of text. And so when we try and do that, when we have, once we pull this text for that critical moment, then there's this reconstructive moment where we try to link issues with other global issues. So like, again, abortion. So even though it's affecting Texas, um, soon after Texas did that, Mexico just decriminalized abortion. So how do we understand this juncture in time? Texas just essentially criminalized it, but Mexico decriminalized it. So how does that affect the migration of folks going from the United States into Mexico? Now, now it's a border issue. Now border patrol is going to be involved at this point. Um, and like the illustrative moment, you know, where we try to take inform, plan, direct action together. So if we understand these things, then what are ways that we can do once we understand this issue, then how can we start organizing direct actions? You know, do we start doing things like helping organizations in Texas to get those who need um, reproductive services in other states or take them to Mexico? Do we need to work with like, is it Doctors Without? Yeah, Doctors Without Borders, you know, can we, can they help in any way? Things of that nature. Um, Garrett, what am I missing here? Um, I think you hit most of it. Um, I, I mostly like this, uh, uh, these moments mixing here because uh, so many uh, leftist uh, organizations and movements and all will get very focused on single issues. And the thing is, almost none of these issues are in a vac vacuum by themselves. They all are, are interrelated and uh, affected by each other because of just the, the nature of the, uh, the capitalist system that exists today, especially this, this neoliberal uh, global version of capitalism that we have that's you know, never really existed before in history. So it's really important to be able to connect all these single issues. And instead of us working in small groups without very much power, we link these struggles together to make a bigger movement that actually does have the power to change it. Absolutely. And I think that's the other thing to emphasize also is that sometimes we think um, we have to be something like organizing work, like it has to be a meeting and do an organizing. I mean, that's a, that's a component, but these reading and discussion groups can be that. It can be simply just having these conversations and maybe start saying, well, what do we need to do to organize? And then kind of go from there or how do we just develop an action plan during that reading group also um because how i kind of tailored some reading groups is we read and this on the same topic read something about the idea and then maybe read like a praxis <clears throat> component to it so if we talk about again say abortion here's all this great text about defending pro-choice, but here, here are some examples of what organizations have done before. Maybe use those examples as to our own direct action. 
Um, and this is something like I have done. Do you have any questions on these two slides? Um, not in the immediate moment, but I might chime in or cut you off to ask something. That's fine. That, that's fine. Um, because yeah, I mean, that's really want to highlight here. And I guess the other thing that Gary and I planned out is well, we won't get into the whole nuance of how to go about the meeting. So I guess I'll say in brief. Um, actually. Yeah, Gary, if you can go back to that slide where it says, how do we start a local reading group? Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of the summation of that. I mean, we can go, if there's anything in, that, in one of those in particular you want to talk about, we can. But essentially, um, if you're going to start your own local reading group, you know, you got to have plan the first organizing meeting as to how dates and times and where, and then choose the reading items you want to do. Um, it, when each session, you know, have maybe some sort of agenda, how to publicize those things, maybe a reading guide as to what the items you're talking about. Um, uh, and then, yeah, running the session itself is, you know, maybe pick someone or a few people to facilitate, depending on how you want to do this group. You may be a facilitator for one for that one day or choosing a facilitator for a series of days on the one text or more. Um, but I'm going to leave that to Garrett now about stack because any, anyone who's facilitating, um, one of the things that is key for any fill, facilitation process is stacking. I'm going to have Garrett talk about that a little bit more. Um, can I can I jump in here real quick? Yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, one one of the I mean, planning the organizing meeting is like the first first step, right? Yeah. Um, so I I just want to like kind of say like how I might go about this, and I would love to hear your guys's insight because you're definitely the pros here. Um. So as a student at UCLA, I'm, you know, involved in a pr pretty wide net of things. And I know a few people that are definitely on board with this sort of politics um, with like reaching out to those people and then kind of like have like a central core group of people that are kind of focused on organizing this whole thing. Um, say like, you know, I'm involved in the Hillel at UCLA uh, Research Club. And uh, like, those are the two big things. And a couple of those kind of just like, you know, reaching out to those people that I know would be interested um, and kind of saying like, oh, I wanna start a reading group. Would you be interested in coming to this meeting and discussing how we might do that? Is that like first meeting, how, how does, how do you focus a reading group and find something that everyone agrees on to be the focus? Pick, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, as Garrett has up here, I mean, this is pretty much like the rundown of what you're just talking about. So if you have a core group, I mean, that's how I would start is having that core group and then bring in those who are interested in participating, you know, because that core group or is that going to be that group that kind of sets a tone for the group that you're going to run. And then that's kind of, the, I mean, so you can have the core group, like pick the readings. If you want to, if you want to do something a little bit more democratic, not saying the core group wouldn't be democratic, but something a little bit more democratic is the core group, pick the books and say, okay, here's what our texts are, what say you, you know, and you can, there's an online um, voting platform called OPA Vote, which does a uh, ranked choice voting for you. Um, you can do it that way. Um, you can do an email, send an email, like, you know, email your the choices and that's the, then we're going to pick. So whatever the, that democratic process you want to choose is you want to do with that. And then, yeah, um, daytime and location. And if you're doing on campus, uh, I have not been to UCLA, but 
for my friends who have, my understanding is that it's huge. And so maybe something central located or um, I guess I tell, I tell radical students that I don't, if you want to go to places that make sense for you, go ahead. But I would shy away from places that would, how should I say this? Uh, places that won't signal off certain people. Like why are these radical students coming together? You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Yeah, UCLA actually has a wide variety of like common areas that you can book out. So it actually, yeah. yeah, and that's like really centralized. So this would be a good, you know, set of places to try to organize from. Yeah, and I guess, and I say that because my experience is like over, over like University of Chicago, where it's like, yeah, I don't think me at the Milton Friedman School of Economics is the best choice to go to, but that's just you. I mean, that's just me, but go ahead. Um, I'm just saying. So, so any common areas, the library, libraries, you know, or uh, anything in the community in LA that y'all feel would be worthwhile, then yeah. Also on here, uh, whatever you want to start an email list, create a little Facebook group. If you want to use Slack, use Slack. Um, Discord, if you want to use Discord. Um, and then also make the decision if you want to do it in person or use like Zoom or 8x8 or whatever video conferencing platform you want to use, um, especially those, if you, especially trying to make it more accessible for those who want to attend but can't come in person also. Mm -hmm. What else, Gary? Uh, yeah, I think that covers um, most of the setup. Uh, you were talking, Jordan, about inviting people from a few different groups. Uh, and I think that would be great to kind of have a, a planning meeting with them to invite maybe like a representative of each group to kind of get together. And, um, uh, you know, are, are they all like focused on, on um, roughly the same topic? Like, are they all um, socialist groups or do they have different uh, focuses? Because like, picking a topic that might be interesting um, across all of those spectrums, that, um, you know. Yeah, helps a lot. Um, uh, one of the big political points that I've been getting involved with on campus is specifically to do with Israel-Palestine. Okay. Um, yeah. And I like I do know a lot of Jews on campus who are pretty already politically active on that front. Um, so being like finding a way to tie that to this other club that I'm more or less going to be leading over the next year which is focused on like a very scientific like praxis kind of um we're working on building a system that takes styrofoam and remediates it and deals like we're feeding it to mealworms and all these other things and it's so so it's like really interesting to a lot of different like people that are interested in like how do i make uh how do i feel like i'm doing something to like fight global warming and all these other ecological issues, pollution. Um, and so like that, those two groups would be like the primary people that I'm reaching out to likely. Um, and so there's, you know, it's definitely political. <laughs> um, gotcha. It's trying to figure out how to synthesize the, you know, the present reality in Israel, Palestine while also discussing yeah. some of the I, I like I topic is like definitely a, a big. <laughs> well, see, this is this is where that um, that slide on uh, Haya Heller from uh, the Institute for Social Ecology comes into play. That um, part of our uh, first step here, our, our critical moment, is being very critical about what's going on in the world and trying to find these relationships between the different issues that even at first maybe don't even seem related. <laughs> like you're saying, how do you how do you mix Israel and Palestine with you know, climate change and styrofoam and things like that. But, you know, um, I can kind of see a connection here already where like uh, most of Israel's military activity is is funded and sponsored by the U.S. government, for example. The U.S. military government, or the U.S. military is one of the biggest carbon polluters in the entire world. It's It, it generates way more than, you know, most countries. <laughs> and not only that, but military bases tend to, um, throw all kinds of toxic chemicals into the environment just by 
the nature of them being there, all of the equipment and technology and bombs and ammunition and things that they have. Uh, they leak all kinds of compounds into the environment. Um, there's actually uh, an airfield in a military base not very far from where I am. Um, and uh, they've detected PFAs and various plastics and all in our water supply. And that's been a thing going on nationwide where uh, military bases have been using these uh, plastic compounds. And you know, I'm thinking of like styrofoam and all toward what you're talking about. Um, they've used it either for directly for military related things, or they've used used it as part of a component for like um, firefighting, you know, like fire extinguishers and things like that. And so all these these chemicals are leaking from all these bases everywhere, <laughs> you know, into people's water supplies and all these things. And and so there's kind of the direct military colonialization aspect of Israel and Palestine, but I bet all of those military bases and things around there are also leaking chemicals and toxins and all that into uh, into the region. Yeah. So, so you know, looking at the relationships between that, I think would potentially be interesting for those groups. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of what I want the focus to this the reading group or discussion group to be is trying to link, you know, as, as Bookton said, the social and the ecological crises and to try to like really show people that they are, or at least help people make those connections themselves that they are, you know, inexorably linked. They're, they're one and the same in that, you know, you can't deal with one without dealing with the other. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's all I know I want to talk about. <laughs> well, I, I think that's, that sounds like where you start then. It sounds like you approach the uh, people from those other groups and, and kind of say exactly this. I see some connections between these things. Can we kind of put together um, a reading list? And you might even agree to kind of um, do like a survey. AJ had mentioned like a few magazines. Um, in these times and Jacobin and things like that, you could probably search some of those magazines, see do they have any articles that are related to these issues. And once you start making a list, um, you know, maybe you could agree on that and, and meet once a week or twice or every other week or something and, and go through that list. Um, I think it would have to be kind of democratically planned like that. You'd have to get together yeah. and talk about it, but. Um, would, would that, you know, we, we mentioned earlier, like finding like that core group of people that are really taking charge and organizing this, would that be, you know, democratically just within that group? Or would you try to like organize it in such a way that it can kind of be fluid and change over time? Yeah. And I guess there's multiple ways of doing it. Um, yeah, there's different ways. Um, I would say probably the initial planning meeting could just be kind of a small core that you think is going to be really uh, hyped up and interested and kind of have some time to dig into it. because. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, finding some readings that are related to the topics that you really want to dive into, that might take a little bit of effort and time to, to kind of do some research and find some things. Um, but you can start with that core, and I think as the as the group goes on, um, as you read more things, uh, it's important to make sure that everyone is heard and everyone is learning during the process. So even though it kind of starts with the core, um, once you get a few readings going, then you can ask new people that are coming in to say, you know, do one of you have a suggestion on what a future topic might be? And do one of you want to be the facilitator that kind of oversees our next reading group or, um, and kind of uh, manages it, I suppose, right? Um, and um, you want to, that way you're, you're bringing in new people and everyone's kind of rotating through all the roles. Everyone is learning all the different parts of the process. Um, so it's not stuck on a core. Um, if it gets stuck on a core, you there's risks where like maybe you're not bringing in new people or even if you are, that core might get burned out. <laughs> you might just be like, oh, this has been so much work. I can't do it all myself. So you wanna make sure that you're kind of rotating people in at a reasonable rate, but it's okay to start with the core and um, you know when you're figuring out the, the very initials. Uh, AJ, you wanna throw anything in? <laughs> No, I, I, you, you say exactly what I would have said. I mean, I think having that core group is is good. And yeah, you can have that democratic process within that core group also. And then if you want to take it to a much larger group of those who are interested, then yeah, take it to them. I mean, any reading group has to be a, a democratic process. Um, because I've been in groups, it's like, like we're going to read this and nothing else. It's like, okay, 
we'll read it. I mean, I'm not going to like it, but whatever. Um, it's just not fun. And then it's like, you know, being in college when you have that one professor who wants to have you read a social justice book that has a very uh, Frederick Hayek theme to it. And you're like, I go, why, would, why are we reading this book? I mean, this makes no sense. But here I am at a Catholic university, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm digressing. It's flashback, yeah, flashbacks for me. Experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, um, I have one question on that like reading list. I have a couple books that have, uh, this is one that I picked up recently, The Uncommon Ground. It's really focused in on, if you're unfamiliar, it's focused in on like trying to understand the like human aspect that is our understanding of nature, like the popular understanding of nature kind of, and it's broken up into essays. Um, but I was curious, like, should you be trying to keep it like something that somebody can just like pick up and read in an hour or less? Or should it be like, I mean, I guess it really depends on the level of commitment you're asking for, but um, how, so, how open should you be trying to make it? So I, I guess I see in two different ways. So one of the examples that we have show on, on this presentation slide, um, one of the groups, an existing group that's down in North Carolina is the Left Unity Study Group. And so what they do is they choose a text. Um, so they, so one of the texts they read was, um, Paulo Ferry's um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So they read the entire book, but they did it for, I think for two months because they meet every Thursday at seven. Well, yeah, seven Eastern time. And like for an hour and a half, they go through each chapter of that book. Mm-hmm. So like with that book, that, that book you just talked about, so you can choose like one of his essays and then next week it could be another essay and the next week could be another essay. So that's one, yeah. that's one option. The other option is you can pull a series of texts saying, okay, we're going to read this one essay in this book. And then next week we're going to read this article. Um, by Heller, and then we're going to read this next book by whoever, or we're going to watch this video on this short little documentary. One thing my brother did when he was organizing, um, when was just doing podcasts, because those are like pretty easy to pick up mm -hmm. and discuss. Um, and they're also easy to, you know, make sure people can get access to, because yeah. like the book, you don't need to have a ton of top copies of it or along that. Yeah, I mean, you should choose texts that are that can be relatively digestible, if it were, for folks. Because, um, like, the one radical study group I help form in my area, uh, I try to choose like three or four things that are very quick to read. Um, so one good example, we did one session on consent. And so I had people read this zine on consent and then a, a website from this um, revolutionary feminist group on their take on consent. And then, and then uh, what was it? Another website from this um, queer organization out of New York about consent as well. And then we just had a, a conversation and everything. So it's, because again, let's just be honest. Some of us try to read at the 11th hour before the session, you know, we're all busy. Um, some of us do try to read beforehand, but you know, in, in between we may forget. So we may have to read, reread something to recall our thoughts, you know? But some folks, I'm like, ah, I got to read this before a group, right? So you need something quick so people can read it, so the idea of what they're talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
if you're like trying to say like you're doing a session like a meeting on or a, on us like a specific issue would be like taking a couple like things and asking people like let's say you pick four things and say read one of these is that like a reasonable thing or do you want to try to get can, people on the same you can do that you can have a reading list saying here's the four things we have and if you read one of these things then now you have like four different perspectives on some of something you know mm -hmm. so the three of us we'll say chris is here if four of us was on here um and doing the thing that you want to do then you have one at least one person that can cover something but if you're going to do that, then I would, you would have to make sure like that one person is like, oh, I got the, I'm reading this book or I'm reading this article, you know? Yeah. One, one strength that I see in that is just, you could have a range of like, you know, intensity of the media. You have like a 30 page essay, but you could also have a 40 minute podcast or you could have like yeah. you know, different levels of commitment that would also let people give different perspectives. Oh yeah. That's often a good way to do um, education and teaching where uh, everybody kind of picks a different thing and has a different perspective. And then they kind of report back to the group. This is what I learned from my reading. This is how I connect it to things I've heard from some other person. So that could be a really good way to get a, bun a bunch of diversity and, and learn from each other. Uh, the flip side to that, I think, is that those type of sessions tend to be really intensive because um, you read one thing and there's three other things. So by the time the meeting's over, your brain is like filled with stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, if you do that, you might want to set aside like a, a longer time frame for that. Um, yeah. And would not try to be like, press it in. Would, well, like the question I have there is like, could you just like have a couple discussion questions and then people could just, instead of like going really in depth on each of the things, you could kind of just try to synthesize all of them. Or would you rather, is it better to like really focus so everyone can kind of see from a similar perspective or I guess there's strengths? Yeah, I've, I've done discussion questions before, before readings. Um, that, uh, that kind of stuff all works, uh, but that kind of all falls in the category of uh, it requires more prep work because mm -hmm. somebody has to be familiar enough with those different readings to be able to design the appropriate discussion questions that are going to get the discussion you want uh, instead of it just being, um, you know, you, you make up a question, but maybe it only applies to one reading and so everyone else feels a little bit con confused about what you're asking. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff when you get your core group together and you have your core members, those are the kind of things to decide together about um, how much time do we want to do in the reading group itself? And then how much prep time do we want to do? And um, who's going to do it and who's willing to do it and all that stuff. Uh, I think it depends a little bit on your goals and how much free time you have and things like that. Uh, AJ? Yeah, I was going, going through here really quickly. Yeah, I think what you just said here is, 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 is good. I, I think, yeah, you just have to, regardless if. <laughs> I, I, I know from experience with, with teaching that it, there's always this trade-off that like you can always have really awesome sessions where there's really deep discussions or, or diversity or, or all those things, really good learning moments where people really um, connect with the material and really understand it, really put two different ideas together that they've never put together. And it's really amazing. To make that happen almost always requires more prep work <laughs> where you have to do a lot more reading yourself ahead of time in order to, to make the questions, for example, to, um, to try to facilitate, to try to, to, try to get that working. Um, so uh, I think that's always the trade-off to think that, um, if you're going for that kind of thing, it's probably going to take a lot more work. So you're, in that case, you want to make sure that you have a very strong core group that you can you can split up to where you're not burning yourself out or you know some other person. Um, and if uh, if you feel like maybe your your course load for uh, for college is too much, um, uh, you might save that for um, maybe special occasions and then try to do something a little bit simpler, uh, you know, week to week. Yeah, um, in regards to the prep side of things, 
I guess how I kind of cheat, if it were, is, you know, trying to encourage folks to re to do certain texts that you know. Because as Gary said, I mean, if you're going to choose a book or something that you don't know about, you, know, you have to read it, digest it yourself, think about questions yourself, maybe prep on the questions that you think are going to be asked or discussion questions that you want to ask because here's the, here's the beauty about these things. We can prep all day, every day, but there's always going to be that organic moment where you don't know where that conversation is going to go. So we can talk about how uh, there's a, a climate issue regarding Palestine and Israel, right? And we may want to go to a certain point we want to make, but the group might go a different direction. And that's, and that's going to be not only beautiful, but something that is going to take a little bit more time to go through because now we're in a whole different conversation phase and everything. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you understand the text enough or the material that you guys you have outlined enough, that will help you get ready for those kind of impromptu discussions. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, for, for someone like myself who done some of these for a while and do interdisciplinary type of research also um I, I i tend to like pick things it's like oh if we do this we do that then we can talk about this we can talk about that oh and hopefully someone talks about this if not i'm going to bring it up so yeah um yeah if and if once you start doing this for a while then you too can start like pulling some stuff together and then get ready then the prep work will be just less time for you yeah yeah i have been doing a lot of reading this last year and almost two years now and it's i mean i have lots of background knowledge but definitely synthesized yeah. is difficult i guess that's where other people come in handy oh yeah oh yeah and also also rely on folks that how should i say this i, I guess my my point i was i'm going to be making here is i don't feel like you have to do it yourself you know, like have other people, like delegate work. And if people have other strengths, let them like take lead on stuff. Um, and that's why I kind of encourage to kind of rotate facilitators for things. So it's not just one person being relied on. Um, like I was in one study group and I had to do all of the planning, prepping and organizing for a year. And I was like, anyone else, anyone else can do this, but no one wanted to. So I had to step aside and no one did anything and it kind of fell flat. So, yeah, I mean, you have to have a good network of folks in your core to rely on in order to make this sustain itself. Yeah. It's nice to have, you know, I guess the only downside to relying on a bunch of students is that they have, you know, all their own, own shit to worry about. But there are, I do have a lot of people that potentially would be reliable and interested. Um, but yeah. it's just in getting it on the table. I, I think one of the most important things um, to address that you're talking about that people, you know, you have all kinds of classes and homework and all kinds of other stuff to worry about. And, you know, even once you're out of college, you there's jobs and whatever to take. <laughs> like, there's always stuff being flung at you. So the, this is just the thing you kind of have to learn to work around. But the way you kind of work around that is make sure that it doesn't feel like a chore, right? You're, you're not trying to design a college class. You're not trying to, <laughs> um, you know, add work to people's schedules and all. But this should be as important as it is. It should also be a, a little bit of fun. It should be that you're getting together and doing something and, um, so, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to meet and talk about an essay, um, you know, why you're getting snacks or, you know, at the cafeteria or at a, you know, getting drinks or something like that, you know, um, meet in a park or something, you know, and whatever you need to do to just kind of be relaxed and let the conversation flow. Um, Cause it's not a class, you're not being graded on it. It's, it's, um, you know, like-minded people coming together to discuss their interests. And uh, as you said, everyone has different background knowledge. 
everyone has different life experiences. And so even though you're reading the same text, everybody's uh, synthesizing it differently because they're putting it through filters from their own lives. And that's what really makes it great when you're coming together and talking, uh, hearing those different perspectives. You know, I lived through this kind of thing and let me tell you about my experience. And, and that's where um, you really learn how to connect all these struggles together. And you, and you build solidarity and camaraderie, right? Because you're, you're getting to know each other on a personal level and not, not just this like uh, professional thing, right? It's, it's not just a student teacher relationship or whatever. It should be, uh, you know, you're becoming uh, comrades in solidarity that you can rely on and help each other out. Yeah, that's, that's another big goal from this is like, I, I want to have a group of people out, like after I leave school that I can know I can rely upon for political struggles and also uh, future endeavors. Yeah, and it, especially if you're doing it on campus, I, um, the greatest hook is have food. <laughs> Even if you're- Free pizza. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I, I mean, if, if you, if y'all have the finances to do it, get a pizza, a, a, two large pizzas for everybody or the nearby Chinese restaurant that's inexpensive enough that you can have your own little like platter of food for everyone, you know, or, or this is what I would do. If you have folks in stu different student organizations, have them pay for it. That's on the table. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> now I was, I was actually going to mention, I, I know that a lot of universities and I would imagine UCLA cause it's so big. Um, when you form a new group, you can form a student group and then go get it registered with uh, the student government or the school administration somehow. And a lot of times they'll give you access to resources, maybe even some small funding um, to hold events and do stuff like that. So you might be able to even get the kind of the school to sponsor a pizza lunch and get everyone together, for example. So Chris, who got us on here, he was, um, he helped form a campus organization called the Radical Student Union at a school. Um, and, and through that, and he, and he did that, he did that during the Occupy movement. And so through RSU, and he was also involved with us in Occupy. So we kind of bridged the two together. So he purposely got the Radical Student Union to get funding and bring in like speakers to come in like Ward Churchill, um, Kathy Kelly, who is like a, here in Illinois, like a big nonviolence activist, um, brought her down. Um, and then, yeah, could rent out any part of the university for free. And so we had Occupy meetings like at the university, like for free, you know? So that's something to consider, like really turn school governance on its head to Gary's point. Uh, it's, unless things have changed across student services, it's just simply bylaws, um, at least five people to start an org, get approved through student government, as Garrett said. Mm -hmm. And then if you get that, then yeah. Yeah, some of the month. people that I'll be reaching out actually have like pretty good experience with working within the student government at UCLA. And I know it's pretty easy to get registered as a club. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be like the Radical Student Union. It can be, I would advocate for that. But it could be simply the, um, uh, if it's social ecology minded, then yeah, it could be the social ecology club, you know? And then yeah, get funding uh, with UCLA's name behind it. You know, you can probably bring in speakers to speak at your little group and make it a big deal. And then given it's in California, I mean, I'm, I, I know between UCLA, USC, 
in the University of California system, there's anyone that's uh, an activist scholar be more than happy to come by. I'm going to excuse myself real quick to get some food, but um, I'll be back in like two minutes. Or okay. Minutes. So when Jordan gets back, you want to get into facilitation or you just want to get right into the yeah, I guess it, it depends on how far, how long you want to go, how long Jordan's available. It's like 10, 15. Yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I like the direction where we're going now. Oh. Um, yeah, this is good. <laughs> um, I wonder if Chris can kind of chop up this discussion and put it on YouTube, you know? Yeah, because of my question, because I just got three different messages saying, you know, sorry, I can't attend, but looking forward to the recorded session. And I'm like, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> You're good to go. I'm going to be muted and eating. But if I have any questions, I'll be sure to. Sure. Stop well, chatting. Oh, well, we have we have a question for you. What is that? So we 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 like this conversation that's going right now. Um, so we thank you for that. Um, the, the we we could go what we have planned out still, or is there anything else that you would like to have as far as a conversation on this topic of forming a, a reading group and everything? Because again, the only thing else we were going to do is Gary's going to talk about facilitation during the group and then he and I were going to give an example about what a reading group discussion would look like so yeah um I would love to hear about facilitation um it's definitely something that I don't have too much knowledge on that'd be great okay <laughs> yeah we can uh we can start with that see where we end up um yeah facilitating is a an important skill um it's a skill so it's definitely something you have to practice so at the first you know kind of the first thing to say is that um you know don't feel too stressed about it <laughs> if it doesn't go perfectly the first time or whatever you, you kind of build that skill over time um it's really just about making sure that uh everyone is is heard so when you're holding any sort of uh, group meeting or organization, it could be this reading group, but it could also be um, a business meeting, uh, for lack of a better term, just if your organization is together, you're trying to make democratic decisions. Um, any sort of meeting like that uh, can have a facilitator whose job is not to lead the discussion. You want it to be democratic. You want everyone to have a voice in it. Their job isn't to lead so much as make sure that everyone is heard. So in that case, um, uh, you know, the facilitator can follow uh, a predetermined agenda that was maybe set by, um, you know, the group as a whole. And um, you can open up discussion on each topic in the agenda, or at least in this case for um, a reading group, uh, it could be a list of discussion questions like you had mentioned, maybe go one by one through. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever agenda sort of thing you're going off of, um, you kind of open up the floor to everyone and, and ask, you know, who, who has a comment or who has a question um, that they'd like to throw in here. And very often um, what we use is uh, called a stack. So in order for everyone to be heard and um, to be respectful of each other, especially in these sort of environments where um, uh, we're trying to have a discussion from different viewpoints and diversity and things, um, we want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to put their ideas out there. Um, so we encourage the use of this, this stacking system where everyone gets their opportunity to speak for a couple of minutes uh, uninterrupted where, you know, people aren't jumping in and, and getting angry and all. And um, hopefully there wouldn't be any anger 
in general, but you know what I mean, like uh, not cutting people off and um, jumping in, whether it's a positive comment or a negative comment, you want somebody to be able to get uh, whatever they want off their mind first. Um, and the way a, a stack works uh, typically is um, you ask the group, you know, okay, who has a comment um, that they would like to share right now? And you just ask people to put their names forward at first. So you look at it and say, okay, AJ has a question, has a comment, Chris has a question, and then you, you stack them, you put them in a, in a list and say, okay, you know, AJ, you go first for a minute and then Chris, you go next for a minute. And you let them speak and you ask the entire group, you know, please don't interrupt, please let them say what they want to for their, for their minute. Let AJ and then Chris speak. And then when you get kind of to the end of your stack there, you pause for a moment and you say, okay, uh, does anyone have any responses to, to what they said or do they have any other comments? And you, you open up the stack again and you ask uh, if there's other people who would like to, to comment. Uh, and so just kind of have that um, very regularly kind of pause and ask, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any comments? And, um, you know, by making that list where you do like two or three or four speakers and then you pause and you say, you know, okay, does anyone have any thoughts on that or questions or whatever, then you do two or three more. Uh, that allows the conversation to kind of uh, to keep flowing, but at the same time, make sure that people um, get their un uninterrupted time, like I said, uh, which is important when we have these diversity things and also important when we have uh, differences of opinion. <laughs> Right, you don't you don't want someone to be shouted down or anything like that. Um, you want to make sure that they're heard, and then someone else can provide their counterpoint to that um, when they're next on the stack. Um, and that's roughly the idea that you're going for. So the facilitator can make sure that that's happening. And if someone tries to jump out of turn, jump off the stack, um, you know, you can kind of warn them like like, hey, we're just trying to have a discussion here. You know, please follow the stack. Um, if you have to, the the group can kind of take further action against them. You know kick them out of the pizza lunch if you have to. <laughs> but, you know, most people, when you just say, this is the rules we're following, um, just to make sure everyone's heard, you know, most people are totally fine with that. They, they understand it and they're totally willing to do it. Just maybe remind them every now and then. Uh, um, to help the, yeah, go ahead. A question on the stack. Um, let's say you say, like, you're asked a question, he's like, who has a, a comment and every single person raises their hand? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. how do you deal with like you know say your stack gets to 12 people long and then you yeah. like write them down and like how do you make sure that how do you yeah, do I, was, it? I was gonna say that if you, if you have a big group actually um you know more than five or ten people or something um in addition to a facilitator you might even want like an extra timekeeper or secretary or whatever you want to call it to kind of help out with that if you get like 10 people interested at once uh, you can write down their names so they have a stack, and then you, but you still might say, okay, I have you all written down. Let's do these three people first, um, and then let those three people talk. So so point them out. Say you know AJ, you're first. Chris, you're second. Jordan, you're third. And then everyone goes in turn. When those three are done, you still have your stack, but pause for a moment and ask. You know you know does anyone have any specific follow up questions or concerns or something? Because occasionally there might be like a really rapid question like, oh, something AJ said, you know, or AJ mentioned a meeting. What time was that? Oh, it's it's at 8 p.m. OK. And then we, you can kind of roll on with the conversation. Right. There might be like a quick little um, point of clarification to make. Right. <laughs> but once you've done the three, then you can keep going down the stack. And then actually, if you do it in that way, you can you can do what's known as a pro progressive stack. Well, there's a few different ways to do it, but um, the simplest way to do a progressive stack is um, the idea is, again, to make sure everyone is heard. And so um, you have your list of who has spoken already, kind of cross them off as, as you go down the list. And if, if someone um, jumps in and says, hey, hey, I have a comment again, I, I want to stack. If they've already spoken once or twice before, um, it's fine if they want to be, uh, if, if they're uh, participating a lot, that's actually really encouraging. But um, if there's someone else on the stack who's not said anything yet so far, then you might say, okay, I've got you on the stack, but you're not next, right? I'm going to put you, I'm going to put you second after this other person because they've not spoken before. We want to make sure that we're getting a nice mix of people first. Um, so you can decide to do that too. So that, that's something your core group can talk about, like what kind of rules for stacking you want to try to encourage um, a diversity of opinion and not just the same two or three people like responding to each other. 
um, that's another point with the stack and all we're trying to ideally you, you don't want the conversation to fall down to just two people back and forth right <laughs> you want to make sure that there's a, a diversity that everyone in the room is getting an opportunity to speak so if you have to kind of shift the stack around a little bit you can tell them that like like okay i know you want to make a comment but let's let's start with this person over here first and then you can go second um so don't don't be afraid to do that if you need to to get that diversity um does that answer your question i i think that was mostly what i wanted to say <laughs> any any thoughts of yours aj no um uh, people like i think the only thing i would say is people think stacking is a very complicated thing but it's not um it, it can only be complicated if people are overthinking what stacking is but like what Gary just outlined, it's really not that hard. And as long as people in the group just respect the stacking process, then it's going to be fine. Um, I only can think of like a, a few examples, most in organizations I've been involved with, where people like, want to like slip in without being on stack like they just want to get their question out there it's like no like you're on stack granted you're the 15th person on stack but you're there so yeah any questions concerns so like your first meeting, you would like go ahead and explain how it works or like, let's say you have a bunch of new members, you'd like make sure that everyone is clear on how that kind of. Yeah, when, when you do your first meeting, I think um, uh, not just reading groups, really organizations in general, I think a, a good thing to do the first time you meet and then maybe regularly if you get an influx of new members is uh, outline kind of the community uh, guidelines. That, uh, the community rules, let's say, and just kind of have a discussion about these are the expectations and these are our goals. We want to make sure everyone's heard. We want to make sure there's just diversity of opinions. So we're going to follow the stacking rule and this is how it works. We're going to have a facilitator each time and the facilitator is going to keep a list of everyone who wants to talk and we're going to go down the list and um, just respect people's time and respect people's uh, space. If you have a comment, wait until the facilitator asks, okay, who wants to be added to the stack? And then say, you know, Garrett stack. Um, and then you'll be added. And then we'll eventually work our way down the list to make sure everyone is heard. And um, make sure that if anyone has any questions about that process up front, that they can ask the questions. Because if everyone feels like uh, they understand the rules and that they've kind of agreed to the rules together, then they're also much more likely to follow the rules <laughs> because it was it was developed and talked about together up front. Um, if you just kind of suddenly come in and say, here's the rules or whatever, um, people may not understand what's going on or they, they might feel negative about it, right? Um, so um, your first meeting outside of your core group, right? The first real meeting you wanna have for a reading group, um, spend a few minutes going through the rules and asking if anyone has any questions or, or comments or concerns about it. Um, and then write them down and make sure that everyone has that list in front of them. So if anyone does jump out of stack or something or cause trouble, you could say, look, hey, our group agreed to these rules and we expect you to follow them or otherwise you're not invited back or you know whatever you have to do. Um, and those rules, like that would be something you'd wanna like get down during the organizing meeting or like, would you want to like open up the rules early on so that everyone that's there feels like they are participating in the making of those rules or yeah I, I think the core group can come up with like an initial set of rules which is basically what we just said right you know you want to do a, a simple stack process um, to just facilitate the conversation um and then suggest that to the group and if the group wants to have any extra rules on top of that for for any special purpose you know um Maybe it varies depending on whether or not you're doing one type of reading group or another reading group, or maybe uh, you have that guest speaker we're talking about and, and you wanna have a discussion with the guest speaker. There might be different rules depending on the event and it's okay for people to suggest, I think we should do it a little differently this time. Um, 
you know, that's part of democratic process. But, you know, the core group can come up with a proposal, right? And so. Always have rules. Yeah, the main, the main thing is to not be stuck with no rules, <laughs> which is actually kind of the topic in a sense of the, the article that we had planned on talking tonight, yeah. uh, structurelessness. <laughs> if you're completely structurelessness, it allows uh, problems to creep into to the group. So um, you wanna set the rules democratically, but once they've been set, you wanna stick to them to make sure that um, you know it proceeds fairly. I think that's all I had on facilitating and stacking. So um, you have anything, AJ, or questions, Jordan? No, I'm there. Um, yeah, I you think- wanna get, uh, You wanna get right into the discussion of the sample text? Yeah, we could try to go through that quick. Uh, do you want me to put it up on the screen? Oh, sure, if you have it. All right, so I put the uh, I put the reading up on the screen. So if, if we want to reference or show anything, let me know and I can scroll it. Um, okay. It, do you want to kick it off, AJ, or do you want me to talk a little? How about you start? All right. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I, with our small little crew here. It's not quite the same as the bigger reading group that we had envisioned. <laughs> That's fine. But yeah, we'll uh, we'll do that later. So, um, so for this, we thought about going over the tyranny of structurelessness here uh, by Joe Freeman. Uh, it's a kind of a classic among uh, feminist organizers because of talking about uh, structurelessness, which. Uh, was kind of a theme that came out of the 1960s and 70s, kind of a, a counter to things being too um, kind of centralized and, and fears of things being too authoritarian. People kind of responded to that saying, no, 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 we're not gonna have leaders and structure and things like that because we don't wanna be that way. We don't wanna be like the oppressors. And um, uh, unfortunately, if that's taken to extremes, it ends up in its own problems <laughs> that um, you know the author here writes about. Um, so, you know, what I, what I had noted was, um, it has a few different, um, uh, kind of main topics here. Uh, the first one is the differences between formal and informal structures, uh, kind of stood out as something important to me where, um, uh, kind of the basic idea being, uh, if you don't formalize structures, if you don't have a set of rules on, on how your organization operates and who's in charge of what and who's responsible for what, um, if that's not formalized into a set of rules, then it becomes informal. It becomes this hidden background thing where decisions have to be made no matter what. So if there's no 
official formal process, then it's going to be an unofficial informal process behind the scenes. So, um, you know, you actually, um, uh, by not formalizing things, you're actually uh, running the risk of becoming less democratic as opposed to more democratic. Um, and that kind of led into uh, the discussion of elitism and what the, uh, what the elite is. And um, I actually personally like this little uh, uh, thing in here that an individual is not an elite. Elite only makes, a, uh, makes sense when you're talking about a group a group structure or lack of structure either way, right? Um, the elite are the people who are making those decisions um, behind the scenes when you don't have the appropriate democratic structure. When you don't have the formalisms in place where everyone can participate, then there's going to be a small group that's making the decisions behind the scenes. Uh, because again, decisions have to be made. Someone has to make them. So if there's no formal process for it, some group of people is going to end up doing it behind the scenes. Um, and while this applies, of course, to smaller groups, that one of the things I immediately thought of is like, this is pretty much how Congress and all works, that <laughs> they disappear behind the scenes and shadows and they write bills and they just come out and say, here's the law now. <laughs> and, and it's because the system as it exists today is just not very democratic. Um, it's, it's, it's not real democracy because for one thing, people are not directly involved in lawmaking. But even in a representative capacity, they're not even particularly representative. <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of shows you again, the, um, if you don't have that democratic structure from the beginning, it decays into these more informal things. Um, yeah, so um, also, you know, related to the elite was also this kind of star system where they said, um, if, if your organization um, has to communicate with the outside, the outside world, right? Outside of your organization. Um, if you don't have some formal process to decide how does, your, how does everyone in your organization feel about a topic and how do we communicate that to the outside world? Uh, again, without formalness, it becomes this informal thing where you have like a star player. You have like somebody who's a, uh, a celebrity, I guess, right? the celebrity begins to be the fill-in person that the news calls them up and says, hey, what do you think about this? And they look at you as if you're the representative of the organization, even though that's never been formally decided. Maybe even a lot of members don't even you know, want that person to speak for them, but that's just what ends up informally happening because again, there's no structure there. So you end up with people kind of representing the organization even though they don't actually represent the organization. Um, so it's, it's, again, all kind of arguments about why you would want formalness, I think. Um, so it, it talked also about um, uh, some conditions that uh, you know, make groups effective, that they have to be task-oriented, they have to be small uh, and homogenous, you know, that they relatively sync up with each other in terms of ideas and goals. Um, they have to communicate with each other highly, and uh, there's a low degree of skill specialization. Um, so that means uh, kind of, a, as we had said earlier, um, I always thought about like rotating job skills and rotating roles. And um, that's kind of how I interpreted this uh, low degree of skill specialization, that it's, it's very easy for you to rotate roles and for everyone to get experience doing everything. So that, um, you know, uh, no one is no one person is in charge of it and becomes the informal leader. Instead, everyone kind of knows how it works, so everyone can kind of step in and, and um, make decisions together democratically if they need to. Um, yeah. Um, so I and the last bit here was uh, some uh, tips from the author, basically about how to. Yeah, or up to this point was kind of an argument about um, why you want to avoid structurelessness. And so kind of this last section is, um, okay, we don't want to be structureless. So what does democratic structure look like? And so there's some tips down here about um, delegating uh, tasks to individuals so that they become responsible for them. So there's, um, there's a person who's responsible. And if, if it doesn't get done or something like that, there's a person responsible that you can talk to them and ask, you know, why did it not happen? Or um, can we help you with that? Or whatever it is. Um, if you're not actually delegating and making someone responsible, 
then no one's responsible. Everyone says, oh, I thought so-and-so was doing it, and it never happens. So I, I can kind of relate to that. <laughs> uh, distribute authority over as many people as possible. That's also a democratic principle. You don't want one leader. You don't want a small group of elites. You want as many people involved in decision-making as possible. And depending on the decision, maybe not even everyone wants to be involved. Maybe some people say, nah, I don't even really care about that. They don't have to be involved, but they they should at least be kind of invited, right? You want to spread um, the net as far as possible. Um, rotating job tasks that we mentioned. Um, uh, allocating tasks that make sense. <laughs> and the, the biggest takeaway for me is that um, you learn through apprenticeship that if someone is new to something, make sure that they have someone they can ask questions from um, and don't just throw them in and, you know, oh, you've never did graphic design before, but we need a graphic for our event by tomorrow at 1 p.m., <laughs> you know, then uh, not only is it probably not going to happen, but now that person is very frustrated because they don't know what to do. They felt like they've been left alone. They feel, you know, you start to feel animosity toward the group. Why did they leave me stuck with this? You know, so. Um, I, I kind of related to that myself. Uh, you want to have a diffusion of information. You want to make sure that everyone um, uh, everyone's aware of what's going on. Again, not everyone has to be involved in every decision making um, in the group, but everyone should be aware that it's going on. And if they want to be involved, then they know how to be involved because they're aware of what's going on. <laughs> um, and of course, equal access to resources. You want to make sure that everyone in the group has the resources to, to get involved and that they don't have to go through uh, a bunch of hops to find what they need. As we found out with Zoom tonight, <laughs> it, it's, um, you know, it's important that people uh, can do what they need to do without um, being restricted from it, whether accidental or um, if the group's too informal, it might be on purpose, right? <laughs> You'll, um, people might try to lock each other out if they're not happy with each other. Um, so you want to try to prevent that situ situation that only the group together democratically is making decisions like that. Um, so that was, uh, that was kind of the notes that I had written up when I read through this and stuff that kind of stood out to me. So I, I'd love to hear what uh, stood out to uh, AJ and, and Jordan if you had a chance to look at it. Well, I can really tell why you chose this article um, this is actually something that I've kind of been struggling with, um, with running one of the clubs that I'm involved with because like, I want it to feel a little more democratic, but at the same time, there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. And so having, uh, me and two other friends are basically at the top of a hierarchy, you know, and it's more of a, it, I don't see it as a hierarchy. I see it more as like, we have certain roles and my position in the project kind of makes a lot of sense because I understand the project better than most of the people, especially the people who are like very focused on individual aspects of it. Um, but trying to figure out how to make sure that there is, you know, the diffusion of information through the group and, um, you know, ability for people to kind of make sure that their voices are heard is something that I've been trying to figure out how it's done when there is this kind of hierarchy that's built into the group already. Yeah, those are interesting questions about um, if an organization is already formed and kind of has this informal structure, what do you, uh, what do, you do about it? Now, the worst part is that I was like very involved in the, the designing of the structure but it was like a very new club. So we needed to be able to figure out how to deal with, let's say 120 members. Um, if we like all of a sudden got a hundred new people, right? How do you deal with that? Um, so we did yeah. kind of decide that we needed some sort of kind of hierarchical structure. Yeah, and, and you know, this is something that we've run into in the Green Party, uh, or at least I've seen this in the Green Party where um, certain rules make sense but only at uh, certain levels, I, I guess I'll call it certain. Um, uh, yeah, I guess levels. <laughs> uh, it, when you have a smaller local group, certain rules work really well for that. But then when you go up to like a national level organization, those rules don't work at all anymore because you're talking a much bigger, broader, diverse group of people. 
um, who don't live next to each other, who don't know each other personally. And, and so those same rules that, you, that apply at a local level don't necessarily work at, at these bigger levels. And that might be what you're kind of running into that when it's a smaller group of people who know each other, um, some of those rules work. But if you're trying to start with rules for a, a group that's uh, 200 people, <laughs> the 200 person group might actually not work if your group is only 10 people, because now you've actually put all this extra pressure and uh, structure on top of a few people. Um, you know, um, kind of overloaded them. And uh, kind of ironically, if there's so much structure, but only a few people, um, I'm kind of making it up because I don't know your bylaws or whatever, Jordan, but <laughs> you know, let's just say if you imagine a group of like 200 people and you split up tasks, you delegate things like this essay is talking about, you delegate it to different committees or smaller groups that work on it and then they bring it back to the whole group. If you make like 10 different committees, that makes sense if you split up 200 people that each, each committee is like 10 people and that's a nice little working group that um, can work on it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have 200 people to split it up, then what happens is a couple of people are now the committee co-chair for like 10 committees <laughs> and you're just overwhelmed with work and uh, you might burn out. And even if you don't burn out, uh, the structurelessness that this essay is talking about is now you kind of have this informal thing where one person owns a bunch of committees because they are kind of running them by themselves because there's no one else to do that. And so now other people get kind of afraid to jump in and help with that thing because, oh, this person seems to be controlling all that stuff. And, you know, I, maybe I don't want to deal with that. Um, so I don't, is that kind of the thing you're talking about, Jordan? Or, you know? um, yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, I mean, the other issue is that this is a, this is a scientific club that I'm discussing. Or yeah, at least yeah. the side that I've, I'm working on is very, like, we're doing some pretty important stuff that's like, does require niche knowledge. So a lot of this stuff doesn't apply because it's, you know, it's not necessarily, the group's not necessarily small and homogenous. Um, it's not, right, right. you don't have the same, you know, not every task is something that everyone can do, um, or is it ne necessarily something that everyone wants to do? Um, right. So trying to figure out that middle ground where it's still like an open, you know, community and people feel able to bring novel questions and stuff to the forefront is something that, um, you know, we're really trying to strive for, but at the same time, there's definitely some issues when you have such a large group and it already does have like some necessary organizational structure. Yeah, what that makes me think of here is this uh, apprenticeship thing that I kind of zeroed in on when I was taking my notes that um, sometimes there really are tasks that require some specialized knowledge and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in order to kind of keep up the, the structure and keep up the democratic goals of the organization, um, instead of leaving one person with that specialized knowledge by themselves kind of in forever, then they, like I was saying, then, then they kind of become seen as the person in charge of that. And that starts to create the informal structure that we were talking about here, that that person's in charge. Whatever the rules and bylaws say, we are not even really worried about that because really it's Bob in charge of it. <laughs> That's what, you know, start worrying about. Um, so I think when you have these, these, uh, these very niche skills, um, you need a specialist, but at the same time, uh, think about ways that you can rotate people in, in uh, an apprenticeship sort of capacity to where they can kind of follow along or mirror that person and begin to learn those skills themselves. So it's not just one person. And, you know, not saying that like one person is gonna like try to purposely be malicious or, or mean or bad or anything like that, right? Um, but just, um, you know, even if they're a really great organizer, a really great person and, and all that stuff, um, it's still just good to not have it funnel through one person. That if if that person's sick one day or something, right? It's, it's good to have, skills built up in, in everybody over time. Um, do you have any thoughts, AJ? I have a couple of thoughts on this text. Um, yeah, go for it. So uh, I got to admit, when I first read this text before, I had I had issues with it, um, 
because I think with one thing we have to understand, and Gary, and you, I think you mentioned this early on, is that when 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 Friedman wrote this important article, really, um, it, it was out of concern that the women's movement in the seventies was being being pushed out, right? And so not every every woman was having a voice in an organization, let alone um, there were various radical um, feminist groups of the 70s that were forming also at that time. And she was kind of more upset that they're kind of these little collectives and this little group and that little group, but there was, they were not doing anything. So this was kind of like her cons call of concern of like, I mean, y'all need structure. I mean, this, what y'all doing is not good and we're going to be burned out really quickly. And then in this text that Garrett just laid out, um, there's some really good points. Um, I mean, I, I do like her take. Oops, wrong one. Um, I do like her take hear about um about formal and informal structures i like her commentary on that um why having formal structures are important um and i and i agree that they are important um and then as well as the very bottom part of uh the democrat the principles of democratic structuring so i think between those two things at least for me were my two takeaways on on how to uh, create a structure and then how make those structures democratic because um, they do need to be flexible um, voices need to be heard and good on Joe for doing that but this is my problem with her text um, you'll have a lot of anarchists get pissed off on this text um, so So there's a another there's a book out there called Stir It Up by Rinku Sen. Rinku Sen is a is an organizer. It's an organizing book. And Rinku Sen uh, talks about Friedman um, in their texts, and and Sen talks about Friedman um, for that very reason that like there needs to be structure in organizations. Um, but. Sen also points out that while there needs to be formal structures and we need to listen to freedmen, um, but we also have to pay attention to groups like the Zapatistas, like how do they work? Um, American Friends of Service Committee, the Quaker group, they're also like a loose knit collective kind of, um, but they work. Both, but both those groups use consensus. You know, and Freeman kind of without implying, well, I think she kind of implies it, but not in a direct way of moving away from a consensus building type of decision making. W would you say that'd be correct, Garrett? I'm actually not sure. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> I mean, because she doesn't like really directly say don't do it but she doesn't say like you know work towards consensus you know um and she's also not even saying you know use robert's rules of order when decision making either but i guess i mean i, I get this is like that my that's my commentary on this is that while there needs to be structure and they need to be democratic even the most anarchist collective that you're a part of like there needs to be some structure to that because we have to remember the circle with a with the circle A means order. So I don't care what anarchist group you're a part of. I don't I don't care if you're an anar you're a collectivist anarchist, a primitivist anarchist, a deep ecology anarchist. I don't care who you are. There's always going to be order, you know. So 
if you need like a working group, then have a working group. If you need a committee, you need a committee, you know? So there's always going to be a level of hierarchy somewhere, you know, just don't have, as Freeman points out, this like elitist formal structure where it's really top down. Cause that's where we get in trouble. Once we start building more, more hierarchies, taller and taller, the more isolated people are going to be in those hierarchies. So if we want to have a more of a democratic process, we need to listen to Friedman um, when Friedman points out, um, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. We're talking about that delegation, the, the distribution of authority, allocating tasks and everything. Like we, we need to, Listen to Freeman on that because if we start doing that, then that formal structure of whatever organization you're going to be in is going to be fine. But people need to, but you need to have that trust in your group. And you also need to make sure, as we talked about earlier about reading groups, we have to make sure that rules are in place. Because if we don't, um, then yeah, your group, that formal group or your collective or whatever it's going to be, is going to falter if you don't have those things in place. So this is, that's, that's my two cents on Friedman. Yeah, that actually made me feel a lot more... Um comfortable with the structure of the club that I'm somehow sitting at the top of a hierarchy for. Um, because like, I, I don't see it as a hierarchy. Really. I mean, I, I do because my one of the other leads literally drew a pyramid and like, ugh. Um, but the the movement, the, the freedom of information, especially the what Freeman says, the diffusion of information from, you know, top to bottom for lack of a better uh, metaphor is like really open, at least it has been in the group so far. Um, and one of my primary goals for this year, especially for new members, is to really make sure that that information, like what we currently have is like explicitly explained to everyone so that everyone's on the same page. Um, and the, like all of our goals, which we've like been pretty specific about making and listing out are carried forward and made very explicit to people in such a way that, you know, we're, you know, the doors of Congress remain closed and we don't really see the goals there um, in this the club that I'm, I'm helping lead. They, they are very clear. Um, and also everyone should be on the same page. I should I should have asked uh, earlier on if uh, you were able to read this uh, before uh, coming on, Jordan. Or it's totally new. Yeah. yeah, it's new, but I'm also familiar with a lot of the concepts because uh, it has been what 50 years since this was published. So people have really carried a lot of these ideas forward. Oh yeah, there's been a lot of discussion since that time period in the in the new left yeah. of how to. Uh, you know, develop uh, de democratic organizations and, and decision-making structures and avoid lots of the problems. Uh, you know, uh, AJ had brought up a, a, a discussion actually that I think still continues to this day between um, consensus-oriented decisions versus making uh, decisions with more of like a, a voting structure. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of anarchists that will, uh, you know, swear by, uh, you know, consensus building because they want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. And kind of the counterpoint to that is someone who wants to be really obnoxiously stubborn <laughs> can block proposals just because they feel like it and, uh, and hold up the group from taking important decisions. And so there's always been this tension there about, um, you know, how do you get the most support on things while also not 
um, holding up the group from taking important actions that are maybe even time sensitive. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I see the phrase tyranny of the majority thrown around on a lot of the internet anarchist groups. Um, and I, I don't really see that as too much of an issue, but I, a lot of them clearly do. Yeah. Um, I think that comes from kind of the other extreme, which uh, is happens a lot in the US, where if you just go with a simple majority, 51% can overrule 49%. <laughs> yeah. And there's something that seems very inherently wrong about that, <laughs> that if there's that much disagreement, then maybe we should be going back to the drawing board, uh, so to speak, and, and discussing this more and seeing if we can't find a different path forward if there's that large of a disagreement. Um, but at the same time, like I said, if there's only one or two people blocking the, the 99%, <laughs> that also doesn't feel very democratic because if, if so many people feel the need to take an action, you know, then you start to wonder, you know, why are the, the one or two people uh, blocking that? And maybe it's because they have a really important reason and we need to listen to them. That's absolutely true sometimes. Uh, but sometimes it's also because maybe they're motivated by, you know, uh, their, uh, their class position in society or something, right, to, to take a different position than everyone else. So it's, it's important to have that sort of analysis and understanding when we're designing these uh, structures. And I don't know that there's necessarily one right answer. <laughs> you know, um, every organization and every decision kind of has to think through these issues about what's the best way to get everyone involved in the process in a fair way. AJ, I think I saw you making faces, so you have a comment? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, this has been super awesome. Uh, I've got to go, but I honestly, the idea of starting a reading group was just kind of floating around the back of my head and is something I wanted to do, but I didn't really you know, know where to start. And uh, you guys really did help me out here. So I'm glad to hear it. Good. See where that goes. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks for being here, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. Enjoy chatting with you.